Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those of you who I'm not uh, yet had the opportunity of meeting, my name is Magnus Renfrew. I'm the co-founder of ArtSG, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this, our inaugural activation for ArtSG. And we're thrilled to have so many of you joining us from right around the world. Uh, ArtSG will take place next year from the 5th to the 7th of November, 2021. Please mark your diaries. And we're delighted that UBS has come on board for the long term as founding and lead partner for ArtSG. And we're also excited that we're already experiencing exceptional interest from leading galleries from around the world. We look set to have a fantastic lineup. It feels highly appropriate that Kim Lim, as one of the Singapore's uh, greatest cultural exports, should be the focus of our very first conversation at ArtSG. And I'm thankful to all our panelists for making today possible. Kim Lim's display at Tate Britain, which runs through to early April 2021, is a delight. And it was the first, first exhibition I had the opportunity to see since the first lockdown in March. It's great that Kim's work is increasingly receiving the attention that it deserves. Uh, and we're thrilled that we're able to help share this exhibition with you. Um, we felt that this was an exhibition that you should all have the opportunity to experience despite the travel restrictions. Uh, with the Tate's kind permission and assistance, we were able to have access on the 4th of November, uh, the day before lockdown two in the UK, to take film footage of the exhibition to facilitate today's tour and discussion. Uh, today's event will be in three parts. The first part will be a guided tour, uh, followed by a panel discussion of expert panelists who we will introduce you to a little later on, and we will finish with questions. Um, please do submit your questions through, throughout using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, to begin the first part of our programme today, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Bianca Chu. And I can think of very few people more qualified to conduct a virtual tour of Kim Lim's exhibition than Bianca. Bianca is a London-based independent curator and art consultant with over a decade's experience at Christie's and more recently as director of Sotheby's S2 Gallery, where she curated over 20 exhibitions including a wonderful show of Kim Lim's work, for which she produced the first major publication on Kim Lim in over two decades. Bianca serves as special projects advisor and representative for the Kim Lim estate and as co-chair of the Tate Young Patrons Council. So as you can see, you're in very good hands. Bianca, over to you. Thank you so much, Magnus, for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be speaking to all of you today and at the wonderful turnout for our digital event uh, with Art SG. Looks like we have over 100 participants at the moment. Um, so thank you all for being here today. I hope all of you are staying relatively sane in these strangest of times. Um, and I'm joining you all from London, where we've, we are now in a second lockdown. But nevertheless, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to speak with you all, uh, no doubt signing in from all different time zones and locations across the globe. Um, before we begin the talk properly, I thought I would just say um, a few introductory remarks uh, about Kim Lin. I know that many of you on this Zoom uh, will be familiar with her. Uh, however, for those of you joining who aren't familiar with her work, um, we thought a brief biographical introduction uh, might be useful to contextualize her practice. Uh, so Kim Lim was a British Singaporean artist. She was born in 1936 in Singapore and passed away in 1997 in London. Lim traveled to London in 1954 with the sole aim of studying art and becoming an artist. She enrolled first at St. Martin's where she studied under Anthony Caro and then in 1956 at the Slade to pursue her interest in sculpture and printmaking. In 1960, she married another artist, William Turnbull and settled in London permanently. Her first solo exhibition in London was in 1966 at Axiom Gallery, and from there she went on to exhibit widely in the UK and in Singapore, uh, as well as abroad. In, uh, from the 1959 period to the 70s period, uh, her practice can be characterized quite broadly here uh, by her work with wood, fiberglass, bronze, brass, and sculpture, uh, and a rich experimentation developed alongside in printmaking, um, which I'll be getting to uh, in the tour. In the 1970s, she was a very present force in the British art scene. Uh, for example, her inclusion in the seminal 1977 Hayward Annual is well documented. And then uh, she was part of the all-female selection committee uh, for the annual the following year. In 1979, Lim had her first major mid-career survey at the Roundhouse in London, which incidentally was also the year she began working in stone and marble, uh, materials which would become primary uh, for her in her practice until her death. 
Um, the last major institutional exhibition in London of Lim's work ultimately became a posthumous show. Um, and that was in 1999 at the Camden Art Center. It's now over 20 years since this event, which takes us on to our tour of the Tate Britain today and the spotlight display, uh, Kim Lim Carving and Printing. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen now and stop the video. So just give me a few moments. Opening in September of this year, this spotlight display has been curated by the brilliant Elena Kurfa at Tate and is part of the series of spotlight sections among the permanent collection routes of the Tate Britain. It is on until March of next year, so with some luck, so hopefully some of you will have the chance to visit in real life. In speaking with Elena, she envisioned this display to have two sections. The first period dated between 1958 and 1960, and the second between 1969 and 1974, with a particular focus on printmaking and its dialogue with limb sculpting practice. The works you're going to see now are a combination of works in the Tate collection and loans from the estate. And I thought it would make the most sense to visit the exhibition in the way that Elena had sought to present the work as she wasn't able to join us today. In highlighting the two modes of Lim's practice, it becomes apparent that she viewed these twin aspects of her work as equal. The subtitle carving and printing at first seems to suggest two different actions or modes of working, but I would suggest that they are in fact synonymous with each other. Often in her printmaking process, an action such as carving or fluting or chiseling, which are normally associated with sculptural or three-dimensional processes are in fact present in her printmaking process. In walking around the exhibition, it becomes easy to become aware that her two-dimensional practice and informed and was constructive of her three-dimensional work and vice versa. Um, so here you're getting the first wall of the of the uh, of the exhibition display here. Um, I actually sort of I wanted to start the tour with um, an archival shot, which you're going to see momentarily, um, where you see this a studio shot here um, of uh, Kim's studio. Um, here you actually see the, the print sphinx in the background and. Uh, King, Queen and Pana sculpture from 59 in the foreground. I wanted you guys to get an idea of what it was like for, the, for, these, for these works and objects to be living together in her, in her studio space and note the formal arrangement of the sculpture. Here on the first wall of the display, we have the untitled lithograph on the left from 59, which is in fact a reference to that early sculpture you saw, King, Queen and Pawn. And uh, here you have King, Queen, a set of bronzes from 1960. Um, the connection between uh, printing and sculpting is particularly palpable here, looking at Sphinx, the sculpture you have in front of you. The sculpture from 59 and Sphinx, the lithograph from 1960, which you saw on the studio wall. Here, the sculpture actually predates the print, which is, an interest, which is really interesting because often we assume that a print operates in a more preparatory way. This is a great example because it really drives home that from as early as 59 and 60, Lim was exploring the potentiality of a process that combines both methods. With so much time on our hands these days in, in lockdown, as I was preparing this tour, I was thinking a lot about time and about temporal ranges in general. And it became apparent to me that Lim operated uh, in various temporal ranges, which relates to her lifelong interest in the concept of rhythm. Here you have Sphinx, the, the lithograph. The actual act of printmaking, as Johnny and Alex have told me before, often required the pulling of a press, a relatively quick but tough movement, and there's sort of an immediacy in that mode of production. Comparatively, ca carving sculpture is a laborious process. It requires a different tempo, pace, physical output. In Lim's case, she never had any studio assistance, often leaning on her sons, Alex and Johnny, as she needed an extra pair of hands. By the time she was working in the marble stone sculptures, the process was lengthy, often taking months to complete one work. I often think of her work in that sense as truly meditative and that there's a suspension of time. On this next wall here, you're seeing first um, right here, the untitled and split red lithographs, a set, and then here a set of lithographs called bridge one and two, and then the chess piece, which I will get to later on from all from 1960. In the bridge prints, Lim seems to be moving more decidedly into formal arrangements. We have a sequential leaning of black forms suspended in midair, balancing, yet also seemingly weightless and dense at the same time. This feeling of rhythm, like the bars on a musical score is still present. 
yet they're expanded in the space, demarcating the space of the forms themselves and the space around them, or the negative space. And I'll kind of discuss negative space a bit more uh, in the next wall. Um, and it becomes because they become even more apparent really in, in the intervals and ladder series. Before that, I would like to go to Chess Piece, um, which is one of my favorite works in the exhibition. Um, here we go. I mentioned the early 1959 lithograph that refers to King, Queen, and Pawn, another wood sculpture that we looked at in the studio shot. We also have the small bronzes King and Queen, and here we have the first explicit reference to the game of chess. I remember the first time I was reviewing the archive for the publication we produced at S2, and there's this wonderful image of Kim and Bill playing chess together by the pool one summer. And I think with all of Lim's work, there's such an intimacy present. Um, and here, it feels like her art has been directly drawn from her life. Whilst at the same time, she has this way with form that touches on the ubiquitous, the universal and the everyday. The pattern sequences of the game in some way echoes Lim's own artistic concerns and the elements of chess would be motifs that reoccur and are expressed and revisited throughout her lifetime. What I love about this work is its simplicity, its reduction of form, taking something so small like a chess piece and elevating it to a larger scale. Lim's attention to detail, her observation has always been something that I've greatly admired. And I think as you're seeing in the details that the richness of the wood and the, the wood grain, the materiality of it, it feels so immediate um, for anyone standing uh, in front of the piece. On this pentultimate wall of the display, we're looking at first a series of prints from 1972 entitled Ladders, which is on the left, um, and Ladders 2 on the right, and the sculpture series Intervals 1 and 2 from 1973. Before I discuss these works, I thought it would be interesting for you all to hear about them in Lim's own words. I think of space as a physical substance to be articulated, manipulated, using space as intervals, Rhythm is another preoccupation of mine. The physicality of the feeling of rhythm makes it very sculptural for me. Light reflecting surfaces and throwing shadows. Um, so here you're seeing a very nice comparison of the sculpture intervals here, as well as the latter's two series from 1972. And you're actually seeing the forms of intervals to the sculpture in the print form here. And the view you've just seen of the sculpture is in fact two sculptures combined, as I mentioned. Intervals one here is at the center, a ladder-like formation and flanked on each side by one component of intervals two. There are in fact a myriad of variations that these sculptures can be exhibited against the wall, on the floor, separately, combined, interlaced and so forth. And you're gonna see a variety of these in the next images. What I love about the way it is shown here at the Tate is in this presentation is its totality made up of three components. And most importantly, the manner in which the light hits the work as it leans against the wall, casting beautiful shadows in every interval in the negative space. From an art historical perspective, there have been connections made between developments occurring in America at the time, such as minimalism uh, with Lim's work when discussing particularly these, these pieces. There's indeed a minimalistic quality to Lim's works, particularly in the 70s period. But as far as we know, Lim was not influenced really by American minimalists. She wasn't really in contact with them. Her and her husband were of course aware of what was happening in the US, um, but their generation was more closely aligned to those of the abstract expressionists who the minimalists were in some ways reacting against. Bill even had exchanges with Mark Rothko and Barnett Noonan. So I think it would be a little bit misguided to link Lim's work to this period with current in American minimalism. Her visual language rather is developing from her own personal experience and cultural diversity, as well as her art education in Britain. In fact, intervals for me is not so much about a concreteness or a lack of expression that characterizes some of the um, works associated with that term minimalism, but the very opposite. It's about the space in between, the invisible, the shifting, and more so there's a strong sense of evocation and emotion despite the aesthetically reduced forms. Traditional Chinese painting, for example, the negative space or blank space, was viewed as as important a mark or gesture as the positive space of the landscape delineated by ink. The white so-called negative spaces of these paintings may refer to the sky or field or large a river and they perform atmospherically. 
And I would suggest that limb sculptures perform in a very similar way in hinting at a feeling. This is particularly apparent in the later stone works, which she takes on a more phenomenological approach to her sculpture and which we'll be discussing uh, in the panel later on. So to diverge for a few moments away from this particular room at the Tate and to transport you back to 1977, intervals one and two were also exhibited at the Hayward Annual that I mentioned early on in the introduction. This is an interesting case study simply because of what it can reveal to us today about Lim's position in her time. I listened to a wonderful lecture last week by Ming Tempo in a conference, Slade London Asia, hosted by the Paul Mellon Center and convened by Hamad, who will be joining us on the panel later, which discussed Lim's unique positionality as inside and outside in relation to the British art establishment. Um, this is a coming from new research around the sort of decolonization of capital and modernism. And there are in fact many transnational narratives that intersect and are woven into the story of modernism. And this was very much the case uh, for Kim Lim. She was inhabiting from within the British establishment to some sense to be included in the 77 annual alongside only men in the show, as you can see from this invitation, but also situated outside due to her background and gender as a foreigner and a woman. Despite this, Lim neither deliberately excluded herself or included herself. She sought to exist in her own orbit and her own trajectory. And I think that's a really important point to make and to think about um, Kim Lim's positionality and her time. So I will be wrapping up the tour in a few moments, um, but here we are looking at the final wall and the print woodcut blue from 1974 and an object um, in the glass of Trine, which we'll see in a few moments, a carved woodblock that Lim used to create the print form. Japanese woodblock printing dates back to the 18th, to the eighth century. And we know from personal photographs of that Kim Lim and William Turnbull went to Japan on their travels. I think this is a really great place to end um, as it brings home the relationship between the printing process and the carving process. So here's the glass vitrine I was talking about. You can actually see some of the images um, as well as a portrait and Lim's own um, notebook. Um, here the tool Lim used to produce the print is in fact a stunning piece of carving. It appears at once like a relief, a mode of carving that we will certainly discuss later in her later works. In the woodblock, you can see every fine detail of her mark making, uh, the concentration, the attention to detail, to surface, to form. It's also worth mentioning that the two dimensional form of woodcut blue would eventually inspire a sculpture itself. I love this detail shot, um, entitled Stack from 1976. Um, which I'll show you an image of and currently in the collection of M plus in Hong Kong. Um, stack is a three part wood sculpture in which each component is stacked one above the other to create this illusion of balancing rectangular planks of wood. Here we're able to see the beautiful multi layered even circular process of how the formal concepts and compositions of limbs practice are thought through and engendered in physical form how they are built up by the tools of her process, and in this case, a, a carved woodblock, in which the woodblock itself is sculpture-like, created through an act of reduction or removing of material on a flat surface. And finally, the two-dimensional print that informed, or produced through the carving of the woodblock, then informing the three-dimensional sculpture you're looking at right now. This image of Stack in 1976 was taken at, um, in Kim and Bill's home in, in Camden Square. So I will finish the tour here and hope that I've managed to do justice to Elena's beautiful display. And hopefully the concept of carving and printing in relation to Kim's practice has expanded for you to demonstrate the unity and the mutability of her process, which is I, I conceive as a wholeness. Uh, thank you all for your time. And I hope you enjoyed the tour. Um, I'll be handing over now back to Magnus and please just a reminder to post any questions that you have in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Bianca, for this very thoughtful tour. It really was excellent to be so expertly led around the display. And we have questions already coming in, though we'll uh, reserve those until after our panel discussion. Uh, and as Bianca just said, you can uh, submit those by pressing the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you're joining us with Zoom or by leaving comments on Facebook if you're joining us on Facebook Live. Uh,
lead us through the remainder of our session, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's panel discussion, Patricia Chen. Uh, Patricia is a highly respected writer, filmmaker and cultural commentator based in Singapore with a focus and passion for visual arts. Patricia is the go-to person on the Southeast Asian art scene and has written for amongst others, Art Asia Pacific, Financial Times, The Art Newspaper and Flash Chart. Her films, Uli Sig, China's Art Missionary and the 24 hour art practice have been screened to critical acclaim internationally. Uh, Patricia has a great capacity for drawing out the story and was the first person I thought of to moderate, which she instinctively, immediately and enthusiastically accepted. And so I'll now hand over to Patricia to introduce this part of the session and to, to introduce our esteemed panelists. Patricia, over to you. Thank you, Magnus. Um, welcome everybody to uh, this panel discussion. Um, thank you, Bianca, for the very informative uh, tour. Thank you, all attendees. Um, um, this is how um, we're going we're gonna, to um, carry on with our panel discussion. First, I will be um, introducing the panelists, and then we will be going through. Uh, we will we will be uh, going through uh, talking about Kim and her practice today. We'll be examining images of her sculptural works and her works in print. We'll be discussing her visual language and influences that had impacted her sculpture and, and print works, and talk about if and how they relate to each other over the course of a career. Then Johnny, uh, her younger son, would be taking us on a slideshow tour of the home studio, where we will have a look at the artist's working spaces, indoors and outdoors, and the marquettes that were also part of his living environment growing up. And then we will just end with a look at Kim Lin's uh, exhibition history in both UK, Europe and Singapore be before concluding on institutional interests in her work in recent years. So um, let me introduce, uh, you, you've heard from Bianca. Uh, we have with us Hamad Nassar. Um, he is a London-based curator, researcher and strategic advisor. He's presently a senior research fellow at the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art, where he co-leads the London Asia Project. He is also the principal research fellow at the, the University of Arts London and co-curator of the British Art Show 9. Um, he was the inaugural executive director of the Stuart Hall Foundation London and head of research and programs at Asia Art Archive Hong Kong. Um, so welcome, um, Hamad. And then we have Johnny, uh, Johnny Turnbull here with us. He is the younger son of Kim Lim and William Turnbull, a talented musician. And uh, he manages the estates of Kim Lim and William Turnbull and the Turnbull Studio and Studio Kim Lim. Okay, let's go. Um, oh, I, I have to actually, for those people with questions, uh, do make a note of them. We will give you a chance to actually ask them at the end of the session. Um, all you have to do is to, uh, if you actually move your cursor down, you actually see a Q&A button right on the, the, the bottom right of the screen. And you can actually type your screen and I'll, I'll just field questions from there. Let's, um, Bianca, let's uh, start with the Tate show that you've introduced us. Um, this show seems to focus on her works between 1958 to 60 and then 1969 to 74. So looking at um, the rest of her works uh, in sculptures and prints, um, my, the first question I had was uh, why this period? Um, why, why did, did the curator and the Tate choose this period to showcase for a Kim Lim solo at the Tate? Um, because a lot of the, the, the stone works, the, the works in stone after 1979 were also not fe featured and those were, uh, are very rich material as well. Um, so I can't really speak for Eleanor, who was the curator of the, of the Tate display. Um, but I think, you know, in these kinds of spotlight displays by nature, they are very focused. Um, and because the Tate was mining specifically from their own collection with uh, some loans from the estate, the idea of focusing really on these early formative years um, where, you know, Lim was just leaving school or just starting her life in London, just married, um, and really kind of creating, I guess, you know, or formulating the visual language 
um, that she would work with for the rest of her of her life. Um, so I think it's it's really more a, a snapshot or and a, and a very very deep one um, at these early years. Mm. You know, I I actually find her quote on of inference very helpful in in appreciating her work, and it it reads. I would like my work to be able to infer experiences beyond the piece itself, infer rather than refer to something specific and particular. So there, you know, that the work seems to have rhythmic punctuation marks on materials, and she's she organized it to suggest a flow, but she doesn't she didn't draw them out explicitly. Um, she used repetition to help visualize infinity and suggest associations. So there were also suggest, uh, there were also essays that uh, suggested that Kim wasn't really concerned with representation and figuration. So would you, would you say the language of inference um, characterizes Kim's visual language? Uh, Bianca. Yes, um, so I think what I love about Lim's work in particular is the sort of subtlety and, and the fact that she's playing with this edge between figuration and abstraction. So often she is, you know, referencing things that she would have seen on her travels, you know, her and, and, and Bill Turnbull, they traveled extensively together um, on her experience growing up in Singapore. Um, on her experience in London, and of course, um, what the kind of art that she was exposed to in studying in the UK at Slade. Um, and I think that there's just this wonderful ability to draw out form and um, shape composition from things that are actually drawn from real life. Um, so there is, yes, there's absolutely this wonderful subtle suggestion um, and hinting at things, which I think is what allows her work to be so, um, well, so seductive in some ways, because it it sort of plays with meaning, it, it, it invites the viewer to interpret things from their pers perspective. As we're looking at these slides of her works, uh, arranged in somewhat chronological order, I can't help but notice um, that the, her titles, the titles of her work are rather interesting. We saw Sphinx, um, there, uh, there's Abacus, there's uh, Pegasus, there's Centaur. And then I saw names like Samurai and Ronin. These are names with strong mythological and, uh, you know, references and character references. And even, you know, even though they, they did change in the 90s and, you know, to references like uh, names like Naga, to Windstone, Breeze, Gobi, Delta, Sea Stone. Um, but they remain, uh, it, they remain quite pictorial, quite explicit in, in, in its su suggestion of the form. So my question is, if suggestion and implication are, uh, are her, her visual strategies, these titles tend to have very explicit character references they kind of do the opposite. Um, so how big a role do you think Kim Lim wanted the titles to play in our reading of her works? Well, you know, I think that's a really interesting point actually, because I can't, I mean, obviously I can't infer exactly what Kim wanted from the titles in, in, in ascribing titles. But I think what's really interesting is that you see this this kind of shift in her thinking. So early pieces, like you mentioned, are much more directive in some ways, referring to ideas of Ronin, a wanderer, or a samurai, um, or an abacus. Um, and as, he, as she sort of moves into the, the sort of early 80s after the 79 Roundhouse exhibition, which was a real kind of watershed moment in her career for herself, um, she starts to adapt titles which are more related to a phenomenological experience is what I referenced in my tour. Things like the, you know, the sound, the feeling of a breeze or like the rolling hills of, you know, a, a, or uh, the sand on a desert plain. And I think a lot of it is drawing exactly from this natural experience. Um, 
and drawing from nature. I mean, you saw on the tour as well, the, 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 the vitrine included a notebook of, of drawings by, by Lim, which included natural plant drawings. Um, so, she, so I think we have to allow for tension and, and contradiction in, in an artist's practice. We can't say it's this or it's that, it's black and white, because I, I think it would be hard to, to, you know, to, 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 to direct you know, um, and, and assume anything about uh, how she felt about the titles in relation to what she wanted people to experience. But I think that there is definitely an importance in the titles that she selected and she definitely selected them with purpose. Mm, thank you. Uh, Hamad, uh, do you feel the same way about her titles? Um, yeah, I would also add one more thing. I think there is uh, an element of invitation in her titles. Um, I think you know, you know she's inviting people to engage with the work. I think your focus on on inference rather than reference is um, I think that's absolutely right because um, it's not just a piece of information that I would argue that uh, it is that Kim is seeking to just convey uh, and communicate, but she's inviting um, her audiences into play uh, almost with with meaning and with form. Um, and I think it's that invitation which keeps the works fresh. You know, I mean, many of the works that we're seeing dating back from the 60s and 70s, um, they, they renew themselves uh, because they allow new people, different generations to interact with these works and make, make fresh meanings from them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Johnny, yesterday you were, you were saying that, um, that not all the world, uh, the works are titled like this. You you mentioned that there is actually a great number of works that were untitled. Can you? Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, I'm uh, very grateful uh, when there are titles. I mean, my brother and I, who uh, I run the estates with, um, you know, when there when there are works called untitled with just a date, it gets it gets really difficult to in terms of archiving so uh you know we're just very grateful when there is a specific title for a work i mean i, I was just reflecting on some of her titling like uh you know ginkgo and thinking about you know that as a, as a tree root and i think when you look at that sculpture it is very evocative of sort of a really gnarled sort of tree trunk and it, it is quite interesting that she kind of takes this idea and and you know, suggest something, and uh, Padma is another one that comes up quite a lot. And I was, uh, that is a deity of um, a Hindu deity, I believe. So mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, it's it's uh, a number of influences that she's drawn from her titles. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're just very grateful that there are <laughs> titles. There. Yeah, I'm talking about titles as a way of um, assessing her works uh, for those people who are not familiar. I think there's, um, for especially for audience um, from this part of the world, um, I think we were recently introduced, um, most of us were recently introduced to works by Kim Lin uh, through a few shows that were held in Singapore. And one of them was held at the National Gallery. Uh, it was called um, Minimalism. Space, light, and hold on, let me see. Yeah, uh, minimalism, and the other one was um, was held by Singapore. Uh, sorry, STPI. So, I think because of the way it was set up and Kim's Kim's works, um, I think it was intervals and columns. They were included and put side by side um, works by um, the other, the other um, minimalists. Um, and so there were, uh, an, an, I, so I was, so there was this general understanding or, 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 or regard of her as, um, as a minimalist artist. So Bianca, just now in your walking through with us in your, your tour, you mentioned that it would be misguided to link Kim Lim's work with currents in American minimalism, and they, that they were more closely aligned with abstract expressionism. So can you elaborate on your reading of her, um, this, also, this association from American uh, minimalism, and uh, how did you arrive at this conclusion? I think it was, it was not so much to 
to say that to disassociate her from anything, but more to say that often we, in hindsight, we try to put together things uh, or styles, movements in a sort of historic way that allows us to try to understand better where certain artists should be placed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in examining Lim's life and work, it's very hard to put her into any category. And so it, I, in, in a way, what I would like for, for people to, to do when they view her work is to try to think of her outside of what, what her work resembles. And, and Hamad and I, we, we sort of talked about this yesterday. Uh, I'll let Hamad speak to it as well. Um, because I think, you know, there's often a, a you know, a, a possibility of limiting an interpretation of an artist simply by associating them with things that are just happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in, and I think when you, when you look at an entire artist of like Kim's, you see that it's, you know, just a certain period of work that can be referred to as minimalist or reductive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the most important thing is to, is to really think of her in her own context in relation to where she came from, um, her experiences, um, and of course, to link with a, a greater sort of story of art history, but also to make room for new stories, for reinterpretations, for the possibility of rewriting some of these narratives and to, to not have one certain centric position on you know, America or Europe um, or men, for example, male artists. Hamad, do you have the same opinion about uh, why Kim, Kim's work are associated with minimalism? You worked at the Asian Art Archive. How important are such classifications and can we allow multiple associations? Um, I think we, we have to, in fact, not, uh, not only allow, but we have to kind of fight for them. Mm. Um, and, and we were talking uh, yesterday, I think, um, when you raised this question around minimalism when we were, were planning for this. Um, and I think Kim Lim's oeuvre and her treatment and, and this sort of um, affinity, let's call it, reminded me of another artist, um, a woman um, born in India, Zarina Hashmi, known uh, primarily as, um, as Zarina who died the, earlier this year in New York um, and in and, and the later stages of her life had, had, um, had reached uh, a considerable sort of acclaim and was being collected all, uh, all around the world. And in a recent text on her, I sort of um, assessed the situation as assimilation by resemblance. Um, she would often, her work would often be called and described as minimalist um, because it it looks um, you know to to quote spare and minimal, uh, and I think what what's what's happening here is a certain kind of violence, um, which is being perpetrated on an artist's uh, work, simply because it resembles like something that an institution has or has attached value to, or particular strands of art history have um, have created a genealogy. And, and as sort of Zarina argued that, you know, that she never accepted the, the grid as a modernist invention, you know, I mean, and she talked about the grid as something that she um, first came across by how her gardener in her father's house would plant flowers by creating little grids of thread. Um, and in that, you know, in that vein, and just looking at Kim's journey as to her interest in architecture, in spaces, in uh, in the physicality of place, I think there's something else that's going on here, which happens to just kind of rhyme with ideas of Western and particularly American minimalism, but are coming from a different place. And if anything, ask questions of minimalism, um, yeah. perhaps seek to expand it, overturn it, or, or uh, and ideally, this is, I think, what um, practices like Kim and, and Zarina's do, is invite us to step into new worlds um, and, to, and to really develop the, a language that is adequate to describe them. I guess with um, Zarina, uh, her, her 
uh, rules, I would say. It's, it's clearer. I think her references are clearer, I would say, because she uh, specifically talk about Urdu and um, some of her personal stories, and that she and, and that is integrated into her form and her art. Whereas in Kim Lim's work, they tend to be, uh, she, she sort of left it open. She left, um, she left the forms open for interpretation. And perhaps um, for people who are new to her works, it is, um, it is common for people to associate her works with minimalism. And especially when um, institutional shows actually put, uh, you know, arranged her works under the banner of minimalism. So I, I think, you know, no matter, I, I had quite a few conversations with people here, and that is the common association. And so this distinction here is, is important. Thank you. But I think just, sorry, just one, one uh, last point, because the work that we're looking on right, right now um, is actually an interesting case in point. And uh, after our conversation yesterday, mm -hmm. I was thinking about that in relation to your earlier question about titles. Mm -hmm. So in this work, um, Zarina is kind of creating pictograms for ideas, for physical spaces, for emotions. She's describing a hot afternoon breeze that you would um, sort of experience in northern India. And if you look at the Urdu title, that of course that's lost on, on people uh, who most of the audience will not know it. So it'll just be described as say, hot breeze. Now, how that translates into, into visual form, I was just thinking about things like uh, titles of Kim's work, like Flow, yeah. uh, for instance. And of course, there are references that will be available to some people if they actually have that physical reference um, or to Gobi as, as a desert. But to, to most people, it's just an abstract idea. And it's an invitation to step into a world that an artist is creating. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would argue is open. So, so for most people uh, in Zarina's work, they don't have those associations and they have to infer them just like uh, as you were um, sort of uh, emphasizing earlier, people have to do with Kim's work. Yes, yes. And I, I think talking about inference, um, I was also um, reflecting on her, the relationship between her sculptures and her prints. Uh, let's just look back on some of the works here, the same um, screen. Maybe we start here. And um, I, I, I think it's, it's, easy to, it's easy to see relationship between both her, her sculpture works and her prints. But I was, um, when I was reading and researching on Kim, there was this quote, there was this essay that you wrote that, and that there was this particular quote that actually puts um, her prints in place because print usually we associate um, with uh, preparatory studies. Um, but in your quote, you, and I would like to read it out for you, and maybe you can comment on it. You said that I would like to suggest a reading of prints as not merely as um, not merely as preparatory sketches, but as musical scores that Lim performs in her future sculptures, often producing, as we have seen above, multiple versions of the same work. Each sculptural work, like a musical performance, allows for variation in play, but shares a rhythm and a design or intention towards the passing of space and time. So would you like to elaborate about, you know, um, this particular relationship? Well, I, um, I sort of, uh, when I first started working, um, I, I curated two exhibitions uh, pretty close to each other um, with Kim's work. And in both exhibitions, I showed both sculptures and prints. Um, and when I was looking at um, one of the uh, sculptural works, Spiral, and, and re researching for that, I came across another work called Naga. And I was struck by how one um, sort of, they, they both have seven Portland stones um, that are inscribed. 
Um, and they, they and, and you know, as we see here, and the spiral could be could be very tight. It could be expanded. You know, it it suggests a kind of infinity. And then Naga is also seven Portland stones, and at, and at first sight, they look they almost look like the same stone. Um, and I was really intrigued by are they? Um, so I mean, if you see see that here. You know, could that just be a different arrangement of the same stones? Um, you know, does does Kim think of her uh, of her sort of um, of her works almost like Lego blocks that are open for rearrangement? And then, as Bianca so um, wonderfully showed us so clearly in uh, the show that Elena Kripa has done at the Tate, is the is the very clear relationship between the latter series of prints and her sculptures like intervals one and two. And whereas with intervals one and two, especially because there's different works um, and, and you can't really play with them as, as, as one would want to. Whereas with prints, it allows uh, them to really, you know, uh, have no limitations to what variations are possible. And that then sort of, and, and looking at, and you showed some images earlier of how um, Lim worked with spiral, so there were different variations and arrangements over water, on 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 grass, on uh, um, you know, here we see it in Manchester Art Gallery. Um, there is this interest in arranging, changing, in transforming, and that suggested to me this idea of of, of a score, because a score is something which is you know it's complete in itself. Um, but it, you know, it's an arrangement. It can be improvised. It can be constantly renewed and refreshed. Um, and and younger musicians uh, still go back to old scores and and reinvent them. Mm -hmm. And then in the same publication, in fact, just reading earlier this morning in a, in Julia Farrar's essay on Kim Lim's prints, mm -hmm. she started with a quote from Barnett Newman, mm -hmm. in which he described printmaking as an instrument. Um, and you know, and then he goes on to say it's like a piano or an orchestra. It interprets, um, and I think that sort of kind of says it all. Um, it's that idea that printmaking allows uh, Kim to compose, and then sculpture allows her to kind of arrange her compositions, mm -hmm. and which she almost always did in at least at least two variations. So she would often work on a, on a maquette size, and then would and would transform them or interpret them in a larger scale. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's where that idea came out of. Thank you. It's fascinating to think of um, a visual artwork as a musical performance. I think that was really enlightening. Now, I wish we can continue talking about her visual language, but in the interest of time, we have to move to the next section, which is the studio tour. So let me just, um, so Johnny, I'm going to pass uh, the, this session over to you. Sure. And I'm going to share uh, I'll, pictures of her, uh, hold, hold on, let me just, uh, yeah, okay. Mm, okay, oops, sorry. Let's look at her studio. Can you give us a bit of context of the space when uh, when she moved in and how how long she stayed for? Did she work? Well, I can't really comment about you know uh, when she moved in because that was bef before my time. But certainly, you know, in terms of this shot, uh, these two shots, if we can just pause there. I mean, um, you can see in the background. I think that's trace under construction in front of the window. So she the, the she had a studio uh, in the right hand side of the house. That was uh, it was a lower ground floor, uh, double length. And um, on the left hand side, you can see um, a desk, which has, I think if you move back to the other shots, you can see a lot clearer the um, the maquettes that are on the desk there. So yeah, yeah, go back. Sorry. Yeah. 
So here we see, you know, this was a kind of a, a mood wall that she would have with, with photographs for sort of inspiration and uh, just ideas. And then you have a lot of these beautiful maquettes, which uh, I think you can see Kuda in the, in the front there and uh, Ginkgo on the left. And, you know, what, I think what's incredible is, is when you look at the, the scale and the detail of the maquettes, and she was able to, you know, translate that into a, a much larger sculpture. And, and then she did all this herself, you know, with no assistance other than, you know, Alex and I helping her out occasionally. But, you know, carving these um, incredible huge chunks of stone with just a chisel and a, and a hammer and upscaling them from these from these sort of tiny designs, which is where I would imagine that the, the, the shape would come from. Um, so we have this section, you know, on, on the left, which is is the maquettes there, and then this fantastic array of tools on this pin board, uh, and you can see a hard hat there, which you would wear sometimes. And there was all sorts of, I mean, going in there as a child, it was it was fascinating to kind of, uh, you know, just it was like a treasure trove of 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 all kinds of things. And uh, she had all the tools hanging up there, various hammers, chisels. Uh, drills, um, files, all these kind of things. And then uh, if you move to the other shot, the right hand side shows, you know, a workbench with um, paint, uh, some paints and a blowtorch. And um, in the middle section, at one point she had a, a printing press uh, when my brother and I, this is, this, is a, this is an earlier shot. So this would have been uh, when I was very young, um, in the early sixties, you can see the um, works under construction that she made in that period. You can see the uh, bridge print in the back. So that's table unprimed. And it's very interesting to see this in the raw wood form. And you can see the chess piece in the background and Borneo and this whole series of sculptures that she made uh, in, in the sixties, which are, are incredibly colorful and playful, which is uh, an interesting contrast, I think, to um, also, yeah, you can see the blowtorch in the background and this wonderful column, which is in Australia. And I think, you know, she must have scorched the wood for that. Uh, this is a Borneo and Table and Minerva. And, and these uh, are the blue centaur in the background there. So, yeah, these are these are sculptures from the 60s, which are very, very colorful and playful, which are, which are wonderful. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it was a fascinating place, you know. Did Alex and you help her and what kind of work? We, we did. I mean, we were we were kind of, uh, we were less allowed into my, my dad's uh, working space. And also he had a workspace that was away from the house. But uh, my mom was always working in the house. And uh, we would ink, help her ink the etching plates um, and help turned she had uh, two printing presses one which had a great big uh, spoked wheel which probably took two of us to turn and we you know and then she had a flywheel press later on so we would yeah we'd be in there inking up the plates and she would uh, she taught us how to etch as well so we have a few of our own etchings from that period which <laughs> I still got somewhere and also in her, she uh, I forgot to mention yesterday you know she had a dark room as well she was a very talented and keen photographer and we would often help her in the dark room drying prints uh, soaking the prints taking them out of the developer and changing the um you know into one of these uh, metal tubs and that kind of thing so it, it was a very interesting place to grow up i mean when i got into skateboarding uh, she actually made my first skateboard for me out of wood and later a, a, a metal one out of this material we found that was like a step from a, a, a double-decker bus so <laughs> It, it was uh, it was a very interesting place to grow up and um, she had a space in the garden as well through the double doors that you can see in some of the shots there's I think um, there's a shot of spiral which shows the outside space where she would work and um, you know I think a, a lot of the yeah, so this is the area where a lot of her works uh, the, the the later stoneworks would have been, the larger ones would have been created in this space there's a there was a gantry to the left which you can't see which she would sort of wheel across and, you know, used to lift and manipulate the, the largest. And this is a, a sculpture Alex and I used to hide in when we were kids. We used it like a little fort. So we had a lot of fun <laughs> with that one. Um, but um, these are some of her maquettes. But yeah, I mean, she would be working at, at home out the back and uh, in my teens, you know, I'd come and visit. 
and you could hear this chipping away around the side of the house and she'd be there in a boiler suit and a headscarf and a mask no matter what the weather you know out there this is Kuda in the front you can see there you know uh, making the mark on these uh, phenomenal bits of stone and I, I think it's it's interesting when you think about making a mark when you relate it to her printmaking because if you look at the, the the process of etching and scribing I think there's 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 a, a great uh, similarity with the process of etching the stone and sort of making the marks on these uh, stones obviously it's a lot more of a um, investment of time the sculpture but what was very interesting as well is we discovered some drawings recently which were pen drawings for studies of the etching so I mean it, it just her sort of method and dedication and you know it's just incredible I think the amount of work that she put in I mean if I, I've practiced martial arts for many many years and you know in comparison I, I mean she would be on a grandmaster status for sure I mean I think you know, hands on <laughs> you know I, I have lots of questions for you but um as we, we need to just move along um I I just and and we have some um participants here, attendees who are from Singapore as well. In her private conversations with you, has she uh, related about uh, her connections with Singapore? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I, it was uh, very much part of our life and culture, Singapore, growing up. We would go uh, every year it's during the summer for the entire summer break. And uh, it, was, it was a magical place to visit as a child. And uh, I think in terms of as a base for travel and visual influence. You know, you can see Borneo in the background, uh, you know, some of the titles, Irrawaddy. I know the Botanic Gardens were a favorite of uh, both my parents and, and my grandparents' garden, in fact. They had a wonderful garden with uh, rambutan and mango trees. And there's a, a lot of sketching that went on and, and you know, perhaps, uh, you know, watercolors or drawings that would have, uh, been a store for ideas that maybe got explored later on. And I think, you know, actually kuda is is a, a word for horse in Malay. So the, the um, idea of using, you know, uh, local culture to, but certainly from looking at the archives as well, I mean, there, there, there were all sorts of things that, you know, there was a, some photos of some coffins that, uh, or some scaffolding, wooden scaffolding that's used in Asia. You know, there's a lot of sort of different cultural references that I think just are very different to a Western point of view. So I think all these things would have, you know, added to the, to the pot of, uh, you know, uh, inspiration that they would have, both of my parents would have drawn from. So, so yeah, Singapore was a very um, constant throughout our life, for sure. Yeah, I was just looking at her exhibition histories. Um, out of 21 solo exhibitions, four were in Singapore and 16 in the UK which actually is actually a good point for us to actually <clears throat> to, to leave this section. Thank you so much for, your working, for walking us through your private space and her working studio. Um, I'd like to talk about um, her exhibition history. Um, there was this particular quote um, that, uh, that I saw um, about her being female and foreign and how she said being female and foreign was never pro a problem as a student. Later, um, I realized that there was a difference, but what was important in the end was what I did and not where I came from. Race and gender were givens I worked from. Perhaps the work does reflect this, which is fine, but I did not want them, uh, want to make them an issue. So what, any one of you be able to share the context of how that quote may have come about? How, and what, what I'm curious about is how being female and foreign and taking such a position, um, whether it affected her place um, in the art scene um, well, I can say a few things. I think Kamad and I, we actually both touch upon this a little bit in the podcast uh, yeah. that came out, uh, I think it was last year now, uh, Sculpting Lives by Sarah Turner and Joe Baring. Um, and I, I actually read this quote because I think it's particularly enlightening to, 
in terms of trying to understand from Kim's perspective, you know, how she viewed herself. And I think it's a really important thing to know that she didn't necessarily focus on this idea of uh, of being female and foreign is something that defined her practice. Um, and I think that's a really important point to make that for her being an artist was being an artist. She was also a mother, she was also a wife. You know, there was no kind of, there was a blurring of all these things for her and it wasn't necessarily um, something that she wanted people to um, necessarily latch onto in describing her work. Um, that being said, you know, she did, there are a few kind of moments where we sort of can intimate certain things. So for example, in 1989, she was invited to take part in Rashida Reen's exhibition, The Other Story at the Hayward, um, which she declined. Um, and, and I think it was more uh, because she didn't necessarily in, agree with this idea of framing herself as other. Um, and you know, we can we can interpret that in a variety of, of, of ways, but I think from her perspective and in the light of in the context of this quote, um, I think it was important for her to be perceived as as an artist and not necessarily as fitting into a category that would be classified as other. Mm. So looking at her exhibition history, can you actually I, I, I know that you've briefly mentioned some of her major shows. Can you walk us through again with the list in front of us, um, which would be the, which you would consider to be important? Sorry, is that for me, Patricia? Yes, uh, yes, yes, Bianca. Yes, please. Um, I, I mean, I, I think it's. I think it's great to note that, that she had an extensive exhibition history in her lifetime. Um, and again, on this podcast, Tamad mentions the fact that she was actually the second most collected artist in Britain um, institutionally, um, based on some, on some research that had taken place. Um, I think it's really important to think about what's happened in more recently, for example. Um, so, uh, starting with, I would say, as I said, the last major institutional exhibition in London was at the Camden Art Centre in 99, um, which ended up, which started, you know, in, in her lifetime, the discussion and the planning, but then only came into fruition after she passed away. Mm -hmm. um, but since then, there had been, you know, shows at New Roche Court, which was obviously a very, a, 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 an important exhibition, bringing her sculpture um, to back in 20, that was in 2014. Um, there's obviously been a number of exhibitions at Singapore National Gallery, as of lately group shows. There was two shows we did at, at S2, um, one show focusing on um, early 70s works, very uh, a small focus group, and then the second larger exhibition focusing on stone and marble pieces. Um, there was also um, Hamad's two exhibitions that he's curated, which have done a lot to recontextualize her in relation to other artists and show, well, the possibility of a, a comparative understanding of other artists that were operating within that same kind of framework, but had been overlooked or I hate that word, but um, really just, I think there's a, there is a general interest right now in the sort of repositioning or rehabilitating whatever kind of word you want to use to describe it but to to, to just review some of the aspects of, of recent art history that have gone to obscure or make invisible certain practices um, due to gender and race mm -hmm. um, and due to let's say the uh, certain ways of writing about art history. Mm -hmm. And if, I could add, if I could add a couple of things to that, I think um, it, it's very clear um, as to how uh, Kim Lim wanted to position herself, but I'm not sure that the art establishment kind of, you know, got the memo. Um, so, so, um, so while, and, and um, I sort of my interaction with Kim Lim's work really started with when I did a little project while I was still in Hong Kong at Asia Archive. Um, creating a little digital archive for Rashid Arain's um, The Other Story exhibition. And, and then in a, in a paper at an Association of Art Historians conference in the UK, 
I argued that that exhibition, which was a kind of a polemical intervention in the history of, uh, of British art and modernism, um, to, to, to argue, uh, it's called The Other Story, and it was to argue for a space for artists from Africa and, and sort of Asian descent as to where, where they were. And Kim had this beautifully, uh, you know, simple, polite, uh, and the gentlest of refusals, um, a letter to Rashid saying, uh, and, and, I, and I remember the phrase, it was like, I do not want to other myself. Mm. Um, so I think that from her positioning is very clear, but having said that, and despite her presence in things like the Haber Annual, not once but twice, mm -hmm. and her being this kind of insider-outsider figure, mm -hmm. she has, if any, a really marginal role in histories of British art, um, or histories of British sculpture, um, and, and, and so on. And in that paper with, with, uh, on the other story, I was arguing that um, what's happening is that, that that show is haunting British art history. Um, mm -hmm. And I read one particular exhibition called Migrations into British Art as an example of that haunting. Um, and what and I and I noticed one of the questions from the participants was around Kim's relationship to other artists from sort of um, uh, Asian and African descent, people like Li Wanxia or David Badala or even Rashida Rain, uh, for example. And, and what was happening was that there were new narratives being, uh, being told and, and um, at places like the Taipei Fine Art Museum for Li Wanxia or the Sharjah Art Foundation um, for Rashida Rain. And I would argue the National Gallery of Singapore with the, with the large retrospective they're planning for, um, for Kim Lim. And I was arguing that these new narratives and these new uh, institutions are no, now going to tell a story um, that will overwrite the story of British art that has yet to be written. Mm. Yeah, and, and out of that then came um, actually the project uh, that Sarah Turner and I uh, co-lead at the Paul Mellon Center called London Asia, mm -hmm. which looks at the idea of this relationship between Britain and, and Asia, not as a comparative one, but as, as an entangled one, where one sort of co-constitutes the other. Mm -hmm. So if you tell a story about David Madala in the Philippines or about Kim Lim, in, uh, in, in Singapore, you're actually co-writing the history of British art. Mm. Fascinating. Well, that's um, listen, a very interesting point. Um, I, I want to pick up, I want to actually end with uh, one last um, question about collections. I do want to ask more about what brought about these renewed interest in Kim Lin, but I, I hope to give some time to Q&A. Maybe someone would, would ask that later, please do. Um, um, my, my last question, uh, Hamad, would be, I, I heard of your podcast, you sharing your, your data. Uh, I, I think you were researching on the most collected Asian artists, Asian African artists uh, um, in, in British collections, uh, collections of British institutions. And Anish Kapoor came, uh, first and Kim Lin came second. Can you tell us more? Yeah, I mean, this, um, so one of the people who listened to the same paper I was describing was the artist and academic Sonia Boyce, um, who at that time was planning uh, a project called um, Black Artists and Modernism, um, it was led by uh, University of the Arts London. And it was a three year project looking at uh, looking at British collections and looking at uh, how uh, art from artists of Asian and African descent are, um, have been narrated as part of the story of modernism within Britain. And as part of that exercise, um, our colleague Anjali Delal Clayton developed a database of, of public collections. Um, and out of that came that particular statistic um, that, you, that you described. And the first of um, the exhibitions that I curated with uh, Kim Lin's work um, was at the Manchester Art Gallery uh, called Speech Acts um, in 2018-19.
And this was very much part of and in conversation with the Black Artists and Modernism Project. And in this, um, I wanted to really question, um, you know, what happens to exhibitions uh, or, or to, uh, to narratives and artworks when you get them, when you remove them from their frameworks of biography and geography. So as and Kim Lim uh, as was describing in her own words, that she wants to be sort of having conversations around what she does, not where she's from. Mm -hmm. um, and in that exhibition, and, and you shared some images with it earlier. Um, so Kim Lim came in, in, the, in the section called repetition, where it was really looking at how repetition as a motif allows us to see how forms migrate. You know, not just from geography, but also between practices. Mm -hmm. So you can mm -hmm. see spiral alongside paintings by Bridget Riley, Anwar Jalal Shamza, or Fairness Azeb. Um, and when you flip it around, you see um, Kim Lim's. Ah, oh, there we, there we go. You see Kim Lim's prints. Um, oh, this is the one. In, this one? No, it's the other one. There. So, so you see Kim Lim spiral, you see two prints, the red and the white, and you see this in, in conversation with uh, a sculpture by uh, Eduardo Palazzi, um, an earlier um, conceptual foot, a photographic piece by Rashid Arain, a textile by Barbara Brown, um, and here you see Bridget Riley and, and, and Shamza and Fairness Azed. And if um, you, you don't have a soundtrack, but if you could, every 20 minutes, this gallery would be punctured by uh, an experimental composition by Delia Derbyshire. So that link between, um, you know, sort of uh, music and, and, and form also continuing. Mm -hmm. And these were all artists who were working and, you know, largely at the same sort of time. And as you would see from the work, they were having a conversation in, in pretty much the same language mm -hmm. in which Kim's work um, could, could function as a punctuation, as she often described it. Mm. But these stories are not stories that you will find anywhere in, in history uh, uh, written either by the academy or by the institution. Um, and, and I think that's the work that is now beginning to, to be done. In the second exhibition where you showed some earlier, um, some photographs earlier, this took place in Abu Dhabi um, and it was called um, Structures of Meaning, Architectures of Perception. And here, um, so you could see Kim's link uh, here, you see prints on the wall, alongside works by Mohandad Kader from Sri Lanka or Seema Nusrat here uh, from Karachi. And if you turn to the other image, um, you can see works here by Rachel Whiteread, Abigail Reynolds, Donald Rodney, Lantian Shi. Um, and again, so these are all artists who are interested in how meaning is constructed through language and navigation of space, mm. how, how art helps us sort of feel the physical acts of, of moving, of seeing, of saying, and inhabiting. And, and Kim quite literally punctuates this space. Mm. Um, and again, I would say these are, are narratives of, uh, of art and of sculpture and, and in particular British art that we are, if anything, collaboratively in the process of, of, uh, of writing now. Mm. Wow. Um, so much to unpack. Thank you so much, um, Kamat, for that uh, conclusion. Um, with that, I shall end this uh, this this panel discussion and move on to the Q&A session. Okay, well, um, well, I have one um, attendee here uh, who's asked, I'm wondering if the panel have anything to say around Kim's relationship to other Singaporeans in the UK at the same time. Lee Wen, Tang Da Wu, Jason Lim, and her relationship to Black arts and to artists like Lian Chia and uh, David Medella. Um, uh, Hamad, would you like to tackle that? Sure. I mean, I, I think in some ways the um, the the primary focus on, on um, 
uh, on, on the sort of this group of artists um, has um, in, in recent times been through the lens of the other story, um, which as we just discussed, is something that Kim didn't feel that she wanted to put herself in conversation with. Mm. Um, and we, I mean, respect that and understand that. But I think as, as curators and art historians, now, I think it's really, um, it's required of us to look more and, and to research um, as to how those conversations happen. Yeah. So, so for, you know, at a very simple example, Liu Anqia, um, and his idea of the cosmic point, I would see certain reflections that perhaps, and certainly some cultural associations um, that I'm sure would be shared um, with, with Kim Lin, particularly as Johnny was describing just, you know, her visual world and references. And as you can tell from the titles, that interest in, in Buddhism, in, in Tao, um, and, and how they translate into repetition and form. I, I see um, Li Wanxia and Kim Lim sharing, uh, mm -hmm. but those conversations and, and that kind of, uh, there isn't a sufficient density of that discourse uh, yet. Um, so I think that's where we need to do a lot more research. Let's hope that with um, all these um, new interests coming around, um, uh, Kim Lim and her connections with different Asian artists <clears throat> and with um, artists in the UK, these relationships uh, would be, uh, yeah, would, would actually be researched a, a lot deeper. Um, I agree with you. I was trying to find out more about her relationship with other Singaporean artists here and I, I haven't gotten much. Um, maybe they, they are around, but they have not been published. Um, well, sorry, if I could just uh, share one more anecdote. So in, um, and, and maybe we can share sort of uh, some uh, links to this material later on. But uh, in a symposium that we held at the time of Speech Act, mm. um, a young um, Singapore born artist, Nicholas T, mm. um, staged a performance in the middle of, of, of the Speech Act exhibition. It was, and it was curated by Annie Kwan. Um, where he, in a way, and that was just the week after uh, Li Wen's uh, tragic passing. Um, so he staged um, a, a work which both referenced Li Wen um, and then wa walked past Kim Lim as he was walking outside. Um, so so there, there was something in there which I thought was really sort of both mm. deeply historically informed Mm. but also deeply relevant now for a completely new generation of artists mm. who are trying to situate themselves mm. within these multiple histories mm. uh, of Singapore, of somebody like Kim Lim, mm. uh, living in Britain, but really of, of the world. Yeah. And there was another uh, related question, but um, in the UK context, and it was, sorry. Mind if I just add something to Hamad's point yes, about? Yes, yes. Um, so when when I was a deputy director at S two, we actually did an exhibition of Liu and Jia. It's one of our first shows that we did in the program, um, and we also did an exhibition. We co curated Darren and I an exhibition on Signals Gallery. We restaged the gallery that existed in London between 1964 and 1966, and it was a really a hotbed of experimentation in kinetic art in particular. Um, but it's an interesting thing to think about how these, these currents were occurring simultaneously within London at that time. And Guy Brett has written quite extensively about the fact that the British art establishment made no, made real no, really no effort to incorporate these artists who had spent most of their time in the UK. Um, Li Wen Jia, for example, never left the UK after coming here via Italy and Taiwan and being born in China. Um, so they have these incredible journeys and stories and Kim, you know, coming from Singapore to, to, to London, that, you know, they, they, their, their dislocation or relocation in some ways speaks a lot to the, the atmosphere in Britain at that time, in London at that time, as actually a scene of, of, of a, a truly international scene. Um, but for some reason, you know, when we think about this period, at least up until quite recently in terms of scholarship, there's been a sort of lack of recognition of this 
internationalism and, and and the ability to 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 really highlight these stories as as legitimate and influential aspects at the time. Um, and I think often, you know, the 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 possibility of incorporating them or reincorporating them allows us to then connect things to an even greater extent to create a bigger network to and and that speaks a lot to um the the, the possibility of a, of a better interpretation or a more nuanced interpretation um that is is so important in scholarship so then with the tate show now ongoing on 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 kim lin do you think that is that we, we can see that as a change of season uh, you know things changing in britain Oh, um, let, let me have let me have a go at this one as a starting <laughs> point. Um, I, I I think it's too early to tell. I think I think what it does show, or or, or what we can be optimistic around, is that there is some intent, but actually it requires a lot more work. Mm. So the example that Bianca that you, uh, Bianca just gave about that quote from Guy Brett about Li Wanqia. Mm -hmm. um, now that was a quote that is repeated again in a new book that came about, by, by, uh, written by Lisa Tickner on London in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. So al although she, she quotes Guy Bread, um, mm -hmm. there is nothing in this sort of voluminous book about signals, yeah. about Li Wanqia, about Kim Lim, you know? So though there again, it, if anything, it's a little footnote. Mm -hmm. And if or if I go back to this exhibition um, that the Tate um, put on called Conceptual Art in Britain. Mm. Now, this was a show that excluded Li Wanxia, Rashid Arain, David Madala, and one could then question what was conceptual art in Britain if you exclude those three. Mm. Uh, and rather than perhaps, I think what, what the Tate needs to, uh, Tate and other institutions need to do is think about how they challenge their own narratives and expand them rather than repeat them. Mm. Uh, and I so saw, saw conceptual art in Britain as a prime example of a repetition of narrative. Uh, similarly, migrations, journeys into Britain, it was kind of repeating the other story, mm. almost but in the same form. Mm. And I think what, what we would hope to do um, is to say, okay, now this Kim Lim display what will it ask about histories of British sculpture uh, and how will that get na narrated in wider uh, exhibitions? Because I think the question is, because stories, it's, uh, it's fairly straightforward to, to tell a, a simple story about the artistic genius who worked in, in her or his studio and then produced all this body of work. Mm. But how about that story connects to other artists, to other works, uh, and they become part of larger um, sort of narrative flows. I think that's the crucial work that needs to be done. And yeah. that's work that cannot be done by one person, one institution or, or one, one country even. It has to be done collaboratively, uh, in conversation, contestations of positions. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really exciting work um, and, and it's something for us to look forward to, I think. Mm -hmm. I have one um, time for one more question, and I think it's a related one. And it says, it, it says, what does Kim Lim do for um, Singaporeans cur uh, Singapore's current writing of Singaporean art history? Hamad, would you like to comment on that? Um. I think you know this goes back to this um, idea on on and, you know on the nation as the way of of uh, of framing. Um, yes, you mentioned that geography. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I mean, so and the project I lead at um, at at UL, I'm actually just developing, is about how nations get curated, and I think there's a certain violence that comes out of when you start applying nation as a frame. Because as we've seen in Kim's work, forms travel, they migrate, you know, you, uh, she's sort of borrowing, referencing, uh, being influenced, you know, the visual archive that she constructs, not just the visual, but conceptual archive, mm -hmm. is beyond simply uh, a nation state. Mm -hmm. um, and then what does that do? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, if you start curating and then na narrating the nation, 
I think it sets up certain blinders. I mean, it's, this is something I've, um, it's an area that I've um, written about and talked about as, um, uh, as a speculative idea of, uh, called art histories of excess, you know, um, for art journal, um, it's, it's a conversation with the art historian Karen Zitzovitz, where I've post, you know, posited the idea that we actually need new art histories that go beyond you know, the, the singular object by the singular artist in a singular place uh, being researched and presented by a singular curator or you know, art historian in a single institution. So how do we do this, I think is the, real, um, is the real sort of urgent question of the moment. And, and you know, I think Singapore's art history, how does it relate to the region, um, you know, particular movements or London for that matter, you know, as, as I was talking about in the London Asia pro uh, project, because somebody else had raised this issue of uh, Li Wen and Tang Da Wu and Jason Lim. You know, how did they relate? Did they hang out? Did they have dumplings together on a Sunday? We don't know. Mm. Um, and I think that's what we kind of need to uh, need to do. Great point. I just have um, just one question, maybe for uh, uh, this is for Johnny. Uh, Johnny, um, it says, uh, uh, Johnny, can you perhaps suggest what might have inspired that form that you used to hide in when you were young? Perhaps a yeah. pot or cooking vessel? It, it may well have been something that simple or perhaps some historical uh, artifact. It's hard to say, really. I mean, I think uh, the sort of symmetrical form is something that seemed to interest her a lot at the time. But... Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't really, or maybe it was an Apollo spaceship. I mean, who, who knows? <laughs> it could be the, uh, the, the, uh, the nose cone of something. I really don't know. But uh, I think, um, yeah, it, it could have been a, a, um, a, an artifact or a tool or a pot, indeed. Yeah. Well, thank it you. Was yeah, it was certainly fun to, to hide in it. You know? it <laughs> and yes, it was, it, was in my, it was created in my lifetime. That was another part it's, of the question. It's called the Echo, right? Hmm. Well, uh, we have a lot more questions, um, but we just don't have time uh, to answer them. Um, they have to do with uh, whether Kim Lim was interested in the work of other sculptors like Hapworth. And then there was another that, was, that talked about how her work seemed very tactile, uh, very central. Do you think it invites um, people to make connections with nature, people and materials? There's another one on whether uh, his connection with Chinese tradition and eating. Um, and there is another one, oh, there is a comment that says that she's actually quite unique because she went to London to study and not many of people, her artists in, in her generation could do that. Um, mm -hmm. So we don't have time to answer them. Um, I just want to thank everyone. Thank you panelists for, all your brilliant answers to um, the questions, um, for sharing all the, the references and materials uh, for participants on this call. Uh, I've learned a lot, and uh, I hope that um, with this session, everybody, when they in future look at works of Kim Lim, you have some ways of assessing and understanding and appreciating her work. Um, so I'm just going to end on this, this note and pass the panel back to Magnus. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Well, I'd like to thank all of our esteemed panelists, Bianca, Hamad and Johnny for their wonderful insights today and Patricia for expertly leading us through it all. Thank you. Um, and thank you also to Bianca once again for your brilliant tour. Um, uh, I just wanted to say a quick thanks to Emma from Art SG for her help in putting everything together behind the scenes because she worked very hard. Thanks to you all for joining us. I very much hope that some of you will have the opportunity to see the show in person at Tate Britain, which runs through to early April 2021. Um, please do feel free to share the recording of today's session with friends on Facebook. Um, and please help us to keep in touch with you uh, by following us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, we very much look forward to seeing you at further of our upcoming events and digital events over the coming months and to welcoming you in person to ArtSG in Singapore in November 2021. In the meantime, thank you very much and stay well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Magnus. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye.